Tonight, cabin fever on the Diamond Princess. You know, I think the biggest thing is we feel like we're sitting duck, we're sitting here, and people who are not even sick is going to be sick. An inside look at life in quarantine on board and on land at CFB Trenton. Plus, some of our viewers ask questions about coronavirus, including how to deal with anxiety in the Chinese-Canadian community. Do you have anything to say as you're being arrested? The RCMP make more arrests at the Wet'suwet'en anti-pipeline blockade in B.C., while sympathy protests could throw a wrench into the morning commute in Ontario. And why you should read the fine print before you use online banking. They've just made this clause which clears themselves of responsibility. This is The National. Weeks after the dangerous coronavirus started sweeping China, the country's economy is battered, its citizens uncertain, and its ability to contain the outbreak unsure. There are signs of progress, and China's government remains confident, but it is still asking for help. Canada has uh, responded to uh, the Chinese requests for medical equipment. We're going to continue uh, to work with them uh, to ensure that they have the resources to uh, contain uh, this virus. And while Canada has not been hit as hard as China, authorities remain on high alert. There are now seven confirmed cases in this country, four in B.C., three in Ontario. And at least seven other Canadians are now sick aboard the Diamond Princess, a cruise ship turned floating containment zone halfway across the world. There are 3,700 people on that ship off Yokohama, Japan, 255 of them Canadian, all confined to their rooms since Wednesday. And as Chris Brown reports, with 70 passengers now sick, tension is amping up. This is about all you can do when it comes to exercise on board the quarantined Diamond Princess. And these passengers are the lucky ones. They've actually got balconies and outdoor space. Uh, so we are on the deck. Uh, we have about an hour to walk around. Lana Chan of Toronto has an inside cabin with no daylight or fresh air. And this was just her second 60-minute outdoor walk in five days. An additional six cases. Then came the captain's announcement of six more cases of coronavirus. When we FaceTimed her, she was sounding pretty stressed. You know, I think the biggest thing is we feel like we're sitting duck, we're sitting here, and people who are not even sick is going to be sick. We saw several ambulances pull up to the ship with attendants hurrying around, though the captain told passengers some of those being taken away had other medical problems. Japanese authorities instituted the quarantine to try to prevent sick people on the ship from spreading the virus on shore. Oh, so a, a lot of different but this medical expert suggests that's also put those on board at greater risk. It seems to me that the people who are now in quarantine on those ships may be at more risk of infection than they would have been if, for example, they've been taken off of the cruise ship and allowed to go home or sent to some other facility with more space than a typical cruise ship. Then again, this concentrated cluster of cases could also help scientists understand the virus better, maybe by learning how it spreads and the rate of severe cases to mild ones. Of course, that's of no comfort to those on board. Jennifer Lee has been talking to the CBC for several days now, but this was our first chance to see her in person. She said passengers are worried about returning home after the quarantine ends and trying to get answers from Canadian consular officials has been difficult. Uh, the passengers have sent mail to them and asked for the posts and um, they have not yet responded. Uh, it's been two days already. Is that frustrating? Very. Very frustrating. Just in case some on board are having trouble coping, the captain also announced if people are experiencing any mental distress, psychologists are available by phone. Chris Brown, CBC News in Yokohama. So if it's that bad for passengers who can at least step outside, imagine what it's like for those who don't even have a window. In the interior room, the walls are a warm neutral color. The carpets are a gray blue. A bedside table and lamp are on either side and a wall-mounted mirror is above the headboard. The Diamond Princess has 379 of these interior rooms. A bedroom, a bathroom, a small closet, and that is it. Each cabin just 15 square meters. That is the size of the average North American parking spot, which is effectively what they are now, a place to park passengers until the quarantine is lifted.
The more than 200 in quarantine, a Canadian Forces base in Trenton, Ontario, are enjoying more freedom of movement. Ashley Burke shows us what it's like for them. I just wanted to give you a quick view of my room. And this is Miriam LaRouche's home for 12 more days. It's really cozy. It's really, it's really cute. The 25-year-old graduate student was studying in Wuhan. I'm feeling good. Uh, just like uh, getting used to this new quarantine life. After so much uncertainty, she doesn't mind being quarantined, especially now that there's an end in sight. I try to watch movies as much as possible here. Uh, I try to relax too because I'm really tired and jet lagged. My mom. It's been a long, exhausting journey for evacuees to get here. I feel most of the difficult time we have already passed. My mother is here. Kai Huang didn't think a 78-year-old mother, a permanent resident of Canada, would be able to board the plane. Now they are roommates, sharing meals together delivered to their door. It's pretty good. My mom loves it. And also with apple and a snack. Just put it on and on your hair and then you pinch it here on your nose. LaRouche is gearing up for the highlight of her day. Finally outside beating some fresh air. I'm not the only one doing it today. Evacuees are allowed outside together in this parking lot. But they have to keep their distance at least two meters apart. It is like so good just to have like human interaction. It's like, wow, it's like just the fact that you can see other people living the same thing as you are living. It's like, you know that you're not alone. But there are logistics. Here is the laundry room. The laundry room isn't big enough for the two meter rule. So people message each other to work out the timing. For Huang, the toughest part is being away from his family. It's been more than a month since he's seen his wife, 10-year-old son, and 1-year-old daughter. I miss them, and they miss us too. He's looking forward to wrapping his arms around them and finally going home. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. And as those Canadians settle into quarantine, across the world, dozens of others are now free. 3,600 people, including 36 Canadians, were cleared to disembark the quarantined world dream today after all the crew members tested negative for coronavirus. And with the Lunar New Year holiday over, many Chinese nationals will now return to work, but the outbreak has hit the country hard. And as Tina Lovegreen explains, gearing back up won't be easy. Normally at this time, Beijing is crushed by the daily rush hour. Not today, even though the holidays are over and people are starting to trickle back to work after two weeks of lockdowns. In many areas, schools are still closed and those who can work from home are told to do so. The rest, to stagger their travel times, to reduce the risk of infections. I think at this stage, uh, they don't have a choice. They can't keep people away from work any longer. Food needs to be distributed. People need to earn wages to uh, pay for the food for their families. This epidemiologist says with more people back on the streets, there'll be a spike in cases. Some people that are going to go on the subways or trains or buses that may be symptomatic and may be spreading this uh, disease. So people also have to be diligent to wash their hands and not touch their face. That concern understandable. 40,000 people in the mainland now infected. 908 people have died making the coronavirus more deadly in China than SARS was globally. All of which has been very punishing on the Chinese economy. Tourism is getting massively hit. The virus has paralyzed much more than tourism. It's also hit China's manufacturing industry. We find uh, Hyundai stopping production in Korea uh, because they cannot get supplies from China. Uh, and this is going to spread further. We know that Foxconn, which produces over half of, uh, of iPhones, probably not restarting production this week. So this is going to trickle down throughout products around the world. And while most of the Chinese economy sputters back to life, the ripple effects will take some time to even out. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, it's unlikely that Hubei province, the epicenter of the outbreak, will have much to do with that economic restart. It remains under a very tight lockdown. In fact, there are reports of some pretty extreme containment measures. Sasha Petrasik is in Hong Kong working on a story. And Sasha, what are you hearing about these tough new tactics in Hubei? Well, Ian, uh, this is really turning into more and more a political operation and not so much a medical one. Party officials have been sent down to Wuhan and Hubei 
Uh, and uh, on the orders of the leadership, they are to round up whoever needs to be rounded up and to do so with no delay tolerated. So what we're seeing and hearing on the internet is uh, police in hazmat suits going door to door, taking people away who either have a fever or are rumored to, uh, to have been in contact with someone who did. Containment is the goal here and uh, using whatever means is necessary. And containment where? Well, they're taking them to improvised facilities. We're talking about sports stadiums or convention centers, big halls with rows and rows of beds and very few facilities or supplies or even doctors for that matter. So the concern is that far from containing the coronavirus, this is actually going to become a whole new breeding ground. Sasha Petrzyk in Hong Kong, where it is Monday morning. Thanks, Sasha. My pleasure, Ian. So many of you still have questions about the coronavirus, so we brought some of yours to an expert. Do we know the demographic of the uh, uh, people who are uh, suffering severely or unfortunately passed away from this? In about 20 minutes, a conversation between concerned Canadians and BC's public health officer. Now to a conflict that's disrupting lives in several parts of Canada, but it's mostly playing out in northern British Columbia where the RCMP have been removing indigenous protesters bent on stopping the coastal gas link pipeline. It's part of a $40 billion project to bring liquefied natural gas from near BC's eastern border to the port of Kitimat. Elected First Nations leaders have signed off on the project, but it's still opposed by the hereditary chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en Territory. Police have been pushing westward from this RCMP checkpoint, following a court injunction to clear out protesters so construction can continue. Greg Rasmussen starts our story there. On the edge of the new police line, two Wet'suwet'en elders are upset they're not allowed to go into territory they consider theirs. I never ever thought that we as Wet'suwet'en people would ever be faced with such a crisis as we're facing today. She says she's shocked at how the RCMP is enforcing the injunction. Is this Canada? Or is it Syria? Where are we? You're giving us a runaround. That's all you've been doing the whole time. Saturday, police blocked most access into a large swath of territory where the pipeline has been approved. Why do we have to fight to go on our own territory? I really feel that's unfair. Today, we were allowed beyond the police line, but only with an RCMP escort. We passed this now empty camp. Do you have anything to say as you're being arrested? Where police made several arrests Saturday as they forced their way into buildings and pulled out 11 pipeline opponents, including some who had chained themselves inside. Not far past the first camp, police say several of their vehicles had their tires punctured by spikes placed on the roadway. And another incident has triggered a criminal investigation. This is the bridge that RCMP say was sabotaged. It's now been made safe and vehicles are once again pushing on up this long road. You are invaders! This video supplied by pipeline opponents shows the two sides facing off. It's in an area further along the road where we weren't allowed to go. An unknown number of pipeline opponents are still refusing police orders to leave structures, including the largest and last one, 66 kilometers up the road. Back at the police line, a show of support and concern. It's not okay. As elders, we've sat back and we've watched. We support our young people with the work that they're doing. Police say they will do what it takes to reopen the road and allow pipeline construction to resume. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, near Houston, B.C. Today, the B.C. Civil Liberties Association and the Union of B.C. Indian Chiefs said they plan to formally complain to the RCMP over what they call police overreach. And they're not the only ones complaining. We need hemp hands, not tar sands. For days now, sympathy protests have been rolling out in various places, like this one today in Vancouver. Local demonstrations have sometimes snarled local traffic, but some are designed to disrupt the travel plans of thousands of people. Farah Morali traveled to one protest partway between Toronto and Ottawa. 
it brought train traffic to a halt in Canada's busiest railway corridor. Inside Toronto's usually bustling Union Station on Sunday, an unusual quiet. Since Thursday, 92 trains have been cancelled to destinations like Montreal and Ottawa, leaving 160,000 passengers scrambling. I've just been told that uh, everything going um, towards Ottawa has been cancelled. A little frustrated. They weren't really telling us anything. They This train was scheduled for 626. They just said delayed indefinitely. Many opted for the long route home today by bus, with Greyhound and Megabus both adding more coaches. It's been a bit of a disaster. Uh, you know, I'm in solidarity with the protests that are going on, but it's obviously complicated to, to get home. Protesters have been set up here in Tyendinaga Mohawk Territory since Thursday night. On Saturday, police arrived to serve them with an injunction, forbidding them from interfering with rail traffic. But if you take a closer look, you'll see they're not physically blocking the rail tracks. They're actually set up right behind the rail gates. CN Rail said today the group is close enough to the tracks to make it unsafe for them to run trains through Belleville. We just like everybody to know that, you know, we're not doing this just to be a pain. You know, we're, we're doing this, out of, like I said, out of solidarity. This Ty and Denega Mohawk spokesperson says they won't move until the RCMP pull out of Wet'suwet'en territory. Until then, we got to show our solidarity to the people out in BC that are getting harmed and hurt. Today, police and enforcement officers with Ontario's Ministry of the Attorney General were seen approaching the camp, but didn't move in to dismantle it. For now, Via Rail has already cancelled a number of trains scheduled for the Monday morning rush. Farah Morali, CBC News, near Belleville, Ontario. Other stories we're watching tonight include a Canadian champion on the links. Yeah. Nick Taylor from Abbotsford, B.C., winning the Pebble Beach Pro-Am. And his wife and family on hand to congratulate him. Taylor beat Kevin Streelman and the legend Phil Mickelson. Taylor's last victory on the PGA Tour was back in 2014. Look at this major flooding in Yorkshire, a deluge delivered by a storm called Kira, the most powerful storm to hit the UK this winter. Wind speeds reached 145 kilometers an hour forcing flights, train trips, and sporting events to be cancelled. It even kept the Queen home from church for safety reasons. Thank you for your support. Now, as I talk about and nearly a week after the Iowa Democratic Caucus, it is now official. Pete Buttigieg has edged out Bernie Sanders in the delegate count. Officials had been reviewing disputed results. Sanders' team is not satisfied. They want a re-canvas of some precincts. This happens as all the candidates are campaigning hard for Tuesday's New Hampshire primary. A North Vancouver man says his bank refuses to compensate him for money he lost through bank fraud because of a loophole in its terms and conditions. Hundreds of people have written our Go Public team with similar complaints after most of Canada's big banks recently updated those agreements. Erica Johnson took a close look at what's in them. It was a strange email for Jeff Harney saying he'd accepted an e-transfer when he hadn't. A fraudster had intercepted it. The money was gone. My, my branch manager indicated there was nothing to worry about if it was a fraudulent transaction. But then the general contractor heard back from his bank. RBC said it wasn't going to reimburse the $1,500 lost to bank fraud. How clear is that in the banking agreement? Well, I'd say it's not very clear at all. RBC pointed to its online agreement, which says the bank is entitled to pay anyone who correctly responds to the e-transfer question and answer. They've just made this clause which clears themselves as responsibility. RBC told us it clearly provides information about protecting against e-transfer fraud in its agreement and on its website. Most of the big banks recently updated their online banking agreements. So, Go Public asked this contract law professor at the University of Ottawa to assess how fair those agreements are to consumers. They are so one-sided and benefit the banks to, to such a degree that there's no way that I would call these ultimately bargained agreements. These are take it or leave it, where the taker really has no option. 
Among other things, Dempsey said, the bank's agreements use vague language, limit liability for losses, say they can change the terms at any time, and decide how they'll let you know. It's just not the way we should have contracts. At some point, I don't think you should even call them contracts anymore. He says the federal government should require third-party oversight. Where the banks are forced to actually include terms that consumers would accept, not terms that the bank wants them to accept. GoPublic asked the Ministry of Finance whether it would introduce oversight for banking agreements to even the playing field for consumers. It steered us to a voluntary code of conduct, last updated in 2004. And Eric is here in our Vancouver newsroom. You reached out to banks on this, and from their perspective, Erica, they, they say the agreements are fair. They do. They say that they are liable for losses in certain circumstances. Also that they have invested a lot of money protecting client accounts from fraudulent activity. But they say that those protections are a joint responsibility with customers who have to read those online banking agreements. Yeah, technically you're supposed to read through all of that. Virtually none of us do. Uh, but you did and you found some interesting clauses. Yeah, for instance, did you know if you use public Wi-Fi for online banking, you are going to be liable for any losses? Also, if you have a banking app on your phone and you share your phone with someone, that could make you liable for losses. A lot of people have a home computer that's used by more than one person. If you use that computer for banking, again, you could lose your protections. One thing to emphasize, if you are doing e-transfers, you have got to have a strong security question and a password that you share verbally the password do not put it in an email or even a text. All right, Erica, thank you. Thank you. Erica and our Go Public team get their stories from you. So if you'd like to go public, email us at gopublic at cbc.ca. Canada's Super Bowl champion is back in Montreal. There's always a little voice in the back of your head where you're like, okay, I don't want to screw that one up. Still ahead on the national. While playing in the big game isn't the most nerve-wracking thing he's accomplished. And we're in Africa for Justin Trudeau's $2 million pitch to get Canada on the UN Security Council. Plus the star power he's adding to the cell. And your questions on coronavirus. Concerned Canadians sit down with BC's provincial health officer to get answers. Back right after this. Tonight, the Prime Minister is on an eight-day tour of Africa and Europe, trying to convince world leaders ahead of a June vote that Canada should have a seat on the United Nations Security Council. But as Catherine Cullen shows us, he needs to convince Canadians too. One of the challenges of getting women to be entrepreneurs has always been there. We're Justin Trudeau is taking his Canada is back pitch on the road. Here in a photo op with female business owners talking about empowering women. It's a pleasure to sit down with uh, uh, President Al-Sisi of Egypt. Uh, this African Union summit, he's been meeting with one leader after another after another, trying to convince them he's really engaged with Africa. So that seems like news to some. Welcome to Africa. I believe this is your first time. Uh, first time to Ethiopia, but uh, not my first time to Africa. Trudeau is hoping to get African leaders votes to give Canada a two-year term on the United Nations Security Council. He's even brought Toronto Raptors President Masai Ujiri along to help him make the pitch. I do view myself as a Canadian citizen. I am a Canadian citizen and I'm a son of Africa. The campaign to get the seat has cost nearly $2 million so far, but Trudeau insists it's worth it. UN Security Council is uh, a place where the biggest issues facing our world are debated, discussed and advanced. Uh, having a Canadian voice at that table is important for Canadians. Not everyone is won over. Yesterday, Norway's Prime Minister, also visiting Ethiopia, gently suggested her country was a better choice for the UN seat. We are using more on development aid. We have used more for support for the international policies uh, as part of our JDP. The future is bright. Trudeau insists that in his meetings, he's not avoiding tough topics, including with Egypt, whose president has been accused of overseeing gross abuses of human rights. In all of my conversations here with every leader, we've talked about human rights. 
Justin Trudeau's campaign to win support for that seat will continue when he visits Senegal and Germany. But tonight he's announced an additional stop. Tomorrow he's headed to Kuwait to visit with Canadian troops. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Addis Ababa. Next on The National, your coronavirus questions and expert answers. Should you travel? How do you keep your kids safe? We invited BC's provincial health officer to sit down with a few concerned Canadians. The enlightening conversation that followed next, but first. It's Hollywood's biggest night, the Oscars, the 92nd Academy Awards honoring the best in film. It's a little earlier in the year than usual, and once again with no host, but all the sparkle and strut we've come to expect. And there's controversy too, and it's being called out. Natalie Portman highlighted the all-male best director category by wearing a cape lined with the names of female filmmakers. Janelle Monet used her show opening performance to praise, quote, all the women who directed phenomenal films. The very first award of the night made for a very happy Brad Pitt, finally winning an Acting Academy Award, Best Supporting Actor for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's not his first Oscar, though. He was named as a producer in the Best Picture win for 12 Years a Slave. You have a brother in the 2nd Battalion. Yes, sir. They're walking into a trap. 1917, the already much feted First World War drama, is widely expected to grab Best Picture this year, but there is a lot of competition, including the South Korean thriller Parasite. If it wins Best Picture tonight, it will make history by becoming the first non English language film to grab that category. It's been two weeks since the first coronavirus case was confirmed in Canada. And while that number is now up to seven, the risk of an outbreak here remains low. And while we've heard from lots of experts on the national, many of you still have questions. So we asked Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's provincial health officer, to join three viewers for coffee and answers. Barbara Mode is especially worried about the risks while traveling. Monica Tam told us about the misinformation in the Chinese Canadian community. And Greg Domville wanted to know what he needs to do to protect his young children. I'm a little bit anxious right now because I do a lot of traveling myself and I have a lot of global members that are planning to come to my big conference. So I don't know how to gauge it. So uh, clearly travel is something on a lot of people's minds right now. And we have to be concerned about what's happening, particularly in China right now. So the government of Canada has advised against travel to China. And we know that there's a lot of measures being taken in China so that travel within the country and out of the country is very restricted. But here in Canada, um, we have very few cases of this disease now. The system is working. We're picking up cases. And travel still remains very safe here. It can be kind of daunting, though, at airports. I was just at YVR, the Vancouver airport, a couple of days ago. There was an entire flight crew from one of the Asian airlines, and all of the flight attendants were wearing masks. And you know, like that kind of can, can be a little bit jarring. Greg, in your situation, you have four kids, yeah. and a couple of them have respiratory issues, I guess. So that yeah. has heightened your concern. Yeah, I parent four and yet two have severe asthma. Mm -hmm. And so when I go out and do a job, I'm shaking 100 hands in a couple of days, and I come home and Hug my kids, hello. Missed you guys. And do I sanitize first? You know, I, I, I have the alcohol so rubs all over me, right? Yeah. And you're absolutely right. You know, alcohol hand rubs, soap and water when you're in the home is right. the best thing that you can do. And if there's, if your hands have any visible soil on them, then using a hand wipe and alcohol or soap and water is the best you can do. But it is such a basic thing. But you know, we call it a motherhood thing. But mom was right. But we do it anyways as human beings absolutely. that we should be washing our hands all the time. So is this a heightened thing that we got to wash it more than normal if we are hygienic yeah. to begin with? Well. Well, you know what? It's the things that you do on a regular basis that we all do that are going to protect us from this virus. So, yes. I'm curious because we haven't heard yet from uh, Monica and Greg in terms of your, your state of uh, concern or anxiety or however. Greg, how would you describe it? Uh, not so much anxious. Uh, I feel safe in Canada, I always have, it's what, you know, it's what we're known for in Canada, but of course you're concerned with the more media, and sometimes media can enhance the sphere, right? Uh, it's on every Google Alert, it's on every radio station, so am I concerned? No, am I curious? Absolutely, that's why I'm here. 
um, but I don't think I'm overly concerned. I just like to know when I need to know. And right now, I think the biggest message is there's a lot of, we don't know. That's right. Monica. And for me, I think, um, I'm also concerned, but not scared to a point of hysteria. Um, but being involved in Chinese community, um, I think there's also, um, I, I can see and sense a lot of my friends. Um, they, they have this fear as well, and it seems like there's a cultural difference almost as to, you know, um, many of my friends wear a mask and um, they're very nervous about this um, because we're getting different information and different news from all different pa platforms. Where are you getting your information from, like in terms of this, it, it, that may help explain why, as you describe it, in the Chinese community in British Columbia, perceptions might be different? Where is the news coming from? Um, people usually share it on Facebook and Instagram, and they use WeChat. Um, so there's a lot of news from China who gets shared that way too. So as a public health officer, you must be aware of that and yes. concerned about the potential for misinformation. And how are you dealing with that in British Columbia with, let's say, uh, the, the heightened uh, concern in the Chinese community? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. Here in Canada, uh, many of us, many of our communities, we have family, loved one, friends who are in China right now. And we're very concerned about them. And we're watching really carefully what's happening there. And I think this is one of the things. You know, this virus doesn't know where geographically you are in the world or where you were born. And it is affecting our, our friends and our colleagues and our communities across the country who have friends and family there in China right now. Here in, in Canada, we still have a very small amount of this disease here, and we still are learning. And I think we're watching very carefully the public health system. Um, we've been watching from the very beginning. We have the specter of SARS in our minds. Um, but we are, we are sharing information in a way that we never have before, and I think that's helping us. But information does change, and it changes as we learn more. You know, is, how is this spread? What is the incubation period? Who's most at risk? These are all things that are really important that we're learning more and more about. But our system in Canada is working. We are finding people who have this disease. All of them can be linked back to, to the area in the epicenter in China. And so we can take some comfort in that, that we know how to detect and test and care for people here in Canada. And as we do this, the inf best information you have is that there has not been a sort of person-to-person -person transmission out on the street uh, in, in British Columbia, for example, yet from this. No, that's absolutely right. And we know that there's um, 20, almost 30 countries where there have been cases, and it's, it's close contact. It's being with somebody while they're sick. Um, that is how this can be transmitted. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah um, for, I mean, uh, besides Tylenol or Advil for like symptomatic relief, what are the, what, what are the treatments for infected patients in the meantime? So that is one of the things. It's a new virus. There are no specific treatments for this virus and no vaccine right now. So that's a challenge. Um, we do know that most people, from the data that we're seeing around the world, most people have a pretty mild to moderate illness. And certainly here in Canada, the seven people that we know, they've all been had relatively moderate illnesses or mild illnesses, which is good news. Do we know the demographic of the um, uh, people who are uh, suffering severely or unfortunately passed away from this? What we are seeing is that it's a very mild illness, particularly in young healthy people, and we see very few children who've been affected by this. So that's good. Um, it's mostly older people, although not that old. <laughs> They've been over 55 or over 60. Um, but the people who have died have been mostly older, and mostly people who have underlying illnesses like diabetes or heart disease or lung issues. It's flu season, as you mentioned earlier, and so the symptoms are relatively the same. Absolutely. So how do parents not freak out when your kid also has a runny nose? Yeah. Well, Is there a way of Here separate? in Canada, you're much, much more likely to develop influenza, and we know that right. because we've seen a spike in, in the last couple of weeks as well as people are very conscious about this and getting tested. Most of the people that have been tested, even if they have come from China um, or affected areas, they've tested positive for influenza and negative for coronavirus. So you're absolutely right. That is something we need to be concerned about all the time. And 
and it, 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 we know that young people in particular. But when do we take our children to the hospital likely. to get tested? Yeah. So I think that's the question. It, it, that is the question, and it's the same for all of the respiratory viruses. If right. you're concerned about cough, difficulty breathing, then yes, they need to be assessed. And if you're somebody who's traveled from the affected areas, particularly from uh, Hubei and, and Wuhan in China, then if you have any symptoms at all, we recommend that you call us in public health, talk to your physician, but call ahead of time, and we can arrange for you to be assessed and tested if needed in a safe way. Thank you. I have a last question okay. for you, and that is, <laughs> I'm close to 70, and I have had heart disease. So would you advise me to travel starting next week? <laughs> I uh, think you, you see, need, it depends so, so much like on where you're going. I right know, now, uh, the, the, we know where the affected areas are, yeah. but I also say that we're watching yeah. very carefully. Yes. We're at what we, what we call a tipping point right now. So it will mm. become very apparent to us in the next week mm. to 10 days, whether they see very extreme mm -hmm. measures that are being taken in China are being effective, mm -hmm. and whether we're going to start seeing this outbreak mm -hmm. um, be, be controlled. So. We need to be wary, we need to be careful and continue to watch, mm -hmm. but when we are traveling we need to also make sure that we're taking all those important mm -hmm. precautions that we do every day. So cleaning our hands, covering mm -hmm. our mouth when we cough, not touching our eyes, and if you're sick, don't travel and stay home and away from others. I really appreciate your taking the time and I appreciate the questions from all of you because I think you're surrogates for a lot of people who are watching that have similar questions, so thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on The National, despite a rare cancer diagnosis, twice, Dominic LeBlanc never thought about quitting. I don't think I'm finished doing what I want to do. Good. I'm well, thank you. As he returns well. to work, Rosemary sits down with the Cabinet Minister for a frank talk about his unique fight against cancer. Plus... Carter. Charlie. Nicole still at work. How a Newfoundlander who acted in an Oscar-nominated movie is watching Hollywood's Biggest Night. Hint. It's a long way from L.A. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, Bombardier, the Canadian industrial giant, is now more than $9 billion U.S. dollars in debt. Will it get another bailout? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Mr. Speaker, let me begin the first time I have to take uh, my seat and to take the floor in this House by congratulating you. Dominic LeBlanc returned to his seat in the House of Commons this week for the first time since his cancer diagnosis. The veteran Liberal MP and Cabinet Minister was forced to step away from his position last year to seek treatment. And despite not being able to campaign during the election, he was still re-elected in his longtime New Brunswick riding. Now LeBlanc is in complete remission and back to work in Ottawa. Our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, sat down with him to talk about his health and his commitment to public service. Mr. LeBlanc, how are you feeling? I'm well, thank you. I'm very well. Dominic LeBlanc's return to Parliament took longer than most other MPs after the election. In fact, he had been away from this place for more than six months. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Yes, you I'm seem well, in good spirits. Yeah, I feel great. Yeah, good. It was his second diagnosis of cancer since 2017. Well, it was a very rare form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a fairly frequent or a reasonably common yes. type of blood cancer, I think. Yeah. Um, but the particular kind I had, uh, there have been around 500 people in the world who have been diagnosed with it mm. since the 1980s. It became clear quite quickly that he would no longer be able to do his job as the Minister of Intergovernmental and Northern Affairs. When the news of my health challenge was made public... His diagnosis was about to take up his whole life. I remember calling the Prime Minister, I think, the beginning of April. I said, that's just not going to work. Um, so he was very, very, very generous for, throughout the whole thing. He is one of your closest friends, though. Yeah, but he's also my boss, <laughs> yeah. and he's also the Prime Minister who has a responsibility sure. to have a functioning government. Yeah. So he looked after that part of it, and then would check in with me as a friend would. Justin Trudeau and LeBlanc have famously been friends since childhood, when LeBlanc sometimes acted as his babysitter. But LeBlanc has been in politics for a lot longer, waiting 15 years to have a chance to serve in Cabinet. He wasn't ready to give up. To be honest, Rosemary, I never contemplated not running again. And I don't think I'm finished doing what I want to do as a member of Parliament or a Cabinet Minister. I wasn't going to let a difficult medical situation cut off something that I love doing. 
LeBlanc flew to Montreal to begin treatment aboard a private plane owned by Jim Irving, a friend and a member of New Brunswick's powerful and wealthy Irving family. The trip was cleared ahead of time by the ethics commissioner, and LeBlanc says it was the only way he could safely get to Montreal. I know you were cleared to do that, but I wonder whether you still think that was the right decision, or, or should you have just driven yourself? No, no, uh, that was absolutely the right decision. The doctors didn't think a 12-hour drive in some cases, you have only a few hours to get to a hospital right. uh, if you develop a fever because you have an infection. Um, and I didn't think trying to find on La Route 20 in Quebec or uh, uh, Highway 2 in New Brunswick uh, to get to an emergency room was the best way to do it. For 56 nights, LeBlanc was in isolation, undergoing a stem cell transplant. It meant he could not campaign during last fall's election, leaving it to his friends, volunteers, and even a former prime minister. Hi, John. How are you? Did you ever think, uh, I, I'm not sure this is going to work out? Or were you positive? The, the election or the medical? No, the medical stuff. Uh, I never doubted the election. <laughs> um, like, it sounds like you got lucky on a lot of fronts, like whether it be the match and the physical ability to, to, to endure it, all those things. Like, it, in some Rosemary, ways. I, I felt enormously lucky. Yeah. At what's the chance you find a 10 out of 10 genetic match donor in another country with the same blood type? who's a younger male. In fact, they found two. L'honorable Dominique Leblanc. A couple weeks later, his immune system now reduced to that of an infant. Leblanc was sworn back into cabinet as president of the Queen's Privy Council. When you showed up for the cabinet swearing in, uh, and you were completely bald at the time. That, that's not true. I had like a little kiwi. Oh. I it's had hard a tiny. To see on TV. Yeah, no, but it yeah. was there. I was kind of proud. It, yeah. It, and you were wearing a mask, more, I think. I asked the doctors if I could go to some event at Rideau Hall, so I probably broke the confidence of the cabinet swearing in. Uh, they laughed and they said, "Yeah, but don't go to the reception afterwards. Mm. Don't shake everybody's hand. Use a lot of Purell and wear a mask," uh, which I did. Yeah. Because uh, I had literally been out of the hospital for two weeks. The honorable minister. Even now, LeBlanc's health is fragile. Coming to work means exposing himself to sickness, but after so many months away, it has also recommitted him to public service. It makes you motivated to want to make a real contribution uh, to the country or to my constituency, because um, that's an opportunity that not many Canadians have, and I've been given that opportunity, so you don't want to waste any day of it. I'm glad you're doing well. Thanks, Rosemary. Thank you for making the time. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. glad to see you. Thank you. Glad to see you. Rosemary Barton, CBC News, Ottawa. Next on The National, the Newfoundlander who's cheering on his colleagues tonight at the Oscars. From his couch, his story is our moment. But first. The Canadian on the Super Bowl chant, Laurent Duvernay Tardif, is back in Montreal. One week after the offensive guard for the Kansas City Chiefs became the first doctor to play in the big game. That's right, he has a medical degree as well as a Super Bowl ring. And today he told Canadian media how it felt to play at that lofty level. Not only one of the smartest, but one of the toughest. <laughs> you walk on the field and there's like DJ Caleb doing the pregame show and Pitbull on the big screen outside tailgating and uh, you know all the media that you've seen throughout the years. It, it was pretty nerve-wracking. I was just looking at the grass in front of me doing my thing and so to like eliminate distraction as much as I can. There's always a little voice in the back of your head where you're like, okay, I don't want to screw that one up, you know, and, uh, and I'm glad we won it. I feel like all the fans from Quebec, from Montreal, from Canada in general, everything is so positive. Last night, uh, I went to grab some, uh, some food across the street from where I live, and there's probably like four or five cars that, that, that pulled down their window and were like, LTT, this is awesome. At the end of the day, it's, uh, it's for those type of moments that you, you work so hard and you prepare, and, and uh, you're going to embrace that that challenge. So it was fun. It was fun. Probably more fun than the, the LMCC, the medical exam. <laughs> the Netflix film Marriage Story was nominated for six Academy Awards tonight and it features a Canadian connection. Newfoundland's very own Mark O'Brien plays a supporting role alongside Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver. But thanks to shooting another film, he can't join his co-stars tonight at the Dolby Theatre in Los Angeles. Still, his story is our moment. Wow, 
So when I walk down the street and I see like a poster for Marriage Story, I I often forget that I'm like, oh wow, well, I'm in that. So it's 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 kind of surreal. I to, to be perfectly honest, I still find it surreal that I'm in any movie. So because <laughs> I oh, I just wanted to be an actor, and I was like, oh wow, like I can't believe they let me do it. Hey, how'd it go? Good. Yeah. And I'd read the script and I just thought it was incredible. It was a very long script. So I knew it was probably going to be, in the end, probably a little bit different than what I'd read. And, um, and I, I was just blown away when I saw it, too. I was like, oh, my God, like, this is so well done. Oh, we're the Beatles. Come on, Charlie. I didn't really get a costume together. You could be George Martin. I don't need to be anything. Oh, you got to be something. I don't believe that it's happening. Uh, it's, uh, it's cool. It's, it's, a, it's a real treat because I just love movies so much. And yeah, I'm going to be watching by myself in New York with my cat. Well, that sounds exciting. Uh, now, I know he's modest, obviously, but if he truly is amazed that he's in films at all, think about this. Not just the much-nominated movie tonight, but Arrival back in 2017 was nominated for Best Picture. He was in that. And for those of you who are CBC TV fans, maybe you're thinking to yourself, Republican Doyle, wasn't that young man on that show? And indeed, he was. That is The National for Sunday, February 9th, 2020. Good night. <laughs>